So with those opening remarks, I'm now going to introduce our first speaker, who I'm absolutely delight, delighted to welcome and was also um, our speaker at our launch, Mr. Jesse Norman, who is the Financial Secretary uh, to the Treasury, but he is also much more. He is Conservative MP for Herefordshire. And I should say, what's very impressive, if you look at the size of his majorities, they get bigger and bigger, which is a testament to his local constituency work, which of course is, is a crucial part of the job. He's also author and has written a great book, which I think must be published last year, perhaps the year before, the year before, I believe, 2018, on Adam Smith, which is highly recommended for a view which says that the conservatives who think Adam Smith is their patron saint have got it wrong, and the people who think that Adam Smith was all about social integration have also got it wrong. And it's actually a much more nuanced view of the founder of our subject. Uh, Jesse has also has many other characteristics and traits, which rather than spoiling them, I'm going to pass straight over to you, Jesse, who is going to speak to us about the macroeconomic questions of for today and tomorrow. So over to you, Jesse, and thank you very much indeed for joining us. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Angus, and uh, welcome to everyone. And what a fantastic uh, intergalactic banquet of joy you have laid out for us over the next uh, few days. And I take my hat off to you and to uh, the Rebuilding Macro program and to NISA for hosting. Uh, and I thank everyone who's uh, joined this seminar because of course one of the great lessons of this discussion is that uh, uh, no man is an island and no woman either and we we give to each other by our participation that's I think a great economic lesson as well as a social lesson um, and like no one can survive an introduction like the one Angus has just given me but I would say one thing and I, I say it for a reason which is it's actually Dr Norman uh, Angus and the reason I mention it, it's the only context in which I will ever use that uh, appellation is when uh, in speaking in, a, in an academic one and so uh, I say that in order to flag uh, a slight distinction because I am not going to be speaking to you today as uh, the Financial Secretary to the Treasury, which is my day job, although I'll try and draw a little bit on that experience, um, which involves thinking about tax policy and being accountable for the revenue and customs, but also thinking about uh, infrastructure strategy uh, for the country uh, over the longer term. I'm going to draw on that material, but I'm not going to speak uh, as a Treasury Minister. and. Um, uh, for that reason, please don't take anything I say as a treasury writ rather than uh, uh, my own personal thinking. But I will try and think slightly more widely, slightly more outside the box in the spirit of uh, the programme that you've uh, so brilliantly been leading uh, with your colleagues, Angus, and uh, also try to draw my own experience as, a, as having taught philosophy for several years uh, in an academic context, uh, as well as by thinking about Adam Smith. Uh, so that is the, the context. If I may, I'm going to do something which uh, um, is probably going to fail entirely, but uh, add uh, this, um, uh, try and uh, split screen and use my, and use a PowerPoint slide pack just to shape my remarks. And uh, if I've got that right, that should be screen sharing now. And I'm now going to try and bring it up to there. Uh, and you'll see from that, I hope, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, Angus has uh, stiffed me with the topic, key macro questions of today and tomorrow, his choice, uh, not mine. Uh, but I'm delighted to talk to those uh, questions and those issues. Uh, and let me start by just saying that I think uh, all would concede that we are, um, in terms of the traditional tools of our trade, uh, in fiscal and monetary outer space. Now, I don't see there are any limits to outer space, um, uh, at least not in the theoretical world that we're discussing, but uh, we are in places uncharted, terra incognita, um, uh, or what sometimes used to be referred to as terra australis, without any disrespect to uh, our Antipodean friends. Uh, but uh, as Andy Haldane brilliantly pointed out last week in his talk to the OECD, there are real signs of progress, and we see those. Uh, and they come in, in two broad forms. Uh, one is uh, improving sources of real-time information, and that can be information from credit cards, it can be from Google searches, it can be from uh, uh, travel information, uh, and of course, uh, new models, and in particular, the use of uh, agent-based models uh, of the kind that um, is now starting to become familiar, certainly in the in financial, uh, model in the financial system, but, but also elsewhere. And I think that that's quite interesting because in a way there is a kind of flow of 
uh, movement, flow of thought, uh, and that is from uh, the financial economy, so often considered somehow external to the macroeconomy, goodness knows why, especially in Britain since it's so dominant, uh, and uh, but a flow of uh, information and practice into thinking about the macroeconomy, and ultimately I, I would like to suggest um, ending up uh, in thinking uh, within government circles, and of course I'd like that in a way to be uh, the other way around. I'd like it to come straight into government. Um, we're sometimes a little slower than some of the people actually directly operating in markets um, uh, are, but uh, we seek to learn from them. And we've been very, very heavily drawing on those uh, sources of real-time information uh, during the COVID crisis. And I, I hope you've seen some of the uh, expertise that that has generated within the Treasury reflected in the programs that we've put out uh, in the last few months to fight uh, the uh, uh, effects of the pandemic uh, and to uh, support uh, people and, of course, uh, their businesses and jobs. Uh, and uh, what is interesting is there's a bit of a grace note, a connoisseurial point, but I think interesting nonetheless, uh, is that that is having an effect uh, in transforming government itself and, in particular, in transforming the revenue and customs, which I'm responsible. And we are seeing that entity move uh, at considerable speed from being uh, a, a, a traditional tax authority of a kind that's fairly recognizable and well understood uh, to being more of a resilience agency and even in due course potentially given the plans that we're making to digitize the tax system and to uh, use information technology to improve the wider structure of our tax administration uh, even to become a productivity agency as we give a nudge to uh, businesses, particularly the lower productive, long tail of smaller businesses in the economy to uh, digitize themselves in reaction to a need to pay tax, VAT, or as it may be income tax in due course, corporation tax. Um, uh, and we hope that that nudge will then transfer itself into a wider take up, a wider uh, awareness of the benefits of digital technology, getting them over that a hump of activation energy required to get moving and then hopefully using that uh, expertise and that familiarity uh, in the uh, work that they do outside just paying their taxes. So that's some of the things that uh, one sees in terms of the effects of the COVID crisis uh, today and sets the context for the kind of remarks I want to make. Uh, but if we were going to move to a slightly more uh, direct uh, concern, and this rather mirrors the points that Angus was making earlier, uh, I think it's fair to say, I don't think uh, many people would really concede that um, macroeconomics is too focused on what might be termed uh, uh, a Walrasian, a Valrasian formalism. And this was beautifully summed up by Marcia Sen in a quote that's I think become fairly ca canonical over the last few years, uh, where he uh, described the profession's uh, a kind of relentless yearning, as I would characterize it, for uh, accuracy, the accuracy of answers to well-defined questions posed with pre-selected assumptions. Now, I don't mean, by using that slightly prejudicial uh, language of Amartya's, I don't mean to suggest for a second that um, what has been achieved is not in its own way hugely valuable. It patently is, and um, the power of a lot of the thought that's occurred in this area uh, over you know uh, decades uh, is I think undeniable, but it's also I think fair to say, and I hope you'll uh, share my view that it is intellectually suspect in key areas, uh, and there we might think of uh, such areas as uh, uh, choice, um, preferences, agents, uh, aggregation, distributional uh, effects. Um, we don't uh, really, I, I would suggest, and I'm not a technical economist, so I'm relying. Um, on the, the uh, what you might call the epistemology of testimony for this, but uh, we don't really um, have uh, uh, well-fitting theories that allow for uh, dynamic preferences as between agents in relation to each other, um, aggregation of individual uh, demand, the distributional effects coming from there from, and therefore I would suggest, slightly building on what some of Angus has said, that we don't really have intellectually a uh, uh, a robust or even anything really approaching a robust understanding of uh, interaction and its many different uh, effects uh, across an economy. And I think that's a very important fact. I mean, take a, take a parallel from the philosophy of language. Uh, you know, for many years, um, uh, uh, there was this kind of obsession with um, 
words within the philosophy of language, um, I mean, in the pre-modern era, and then uh, it, the, it, it kind of arrived as though a lightning bolt, but actually the unit of meaning uh, in language is the sentence rather than the individual word. Now, if you try to characterize what a word is, you can do so uh, quite successfully in many ways. Look at Johnson's dictionary, look at the Oxford uh, English dictionary, but you can't characterize it in any comprehensive way outside its relationship to other words within sentences. And uh, it's the sentence that's the union of unit of meaning. And I, I want to suggest in that sense, it's the agent as interacting, as interlocking with other agents, as in what you might call community, that is the unit of somehow the unit of economic meaning. And uh, I just, I think that's quite a pregnant and interesting way of thinking about this. We don't want to, we want to get away from what Wittgenstein would have referred to as an Augustinian idea of words. It's kind of name, uh, names for things or single words operating in themselves. I think we want to do something similar uh, in uh, economics and uh, its related subjects. So those are the kinds of uh, problems that I think uh, this um, wider uh, general equilibrium um, formalistic approach uh, is prone to. Let's just push on a little bit, if I may, uh, and see what Adam Smith would have said in reaction to this. Uh, and Smith has a marvelous line, as you may know. He says, um, nobody ever saw a dog make a fair and deliberate exchange of one bone for another with another dog. Nobody ever saw one animal by its gestures and natural cries signify to another, this is mine, that's yours. I am willing to give you this for that. But man has almost constant occasion for the help of his brethren. And uh, I want to point that not just uh, because I think it's an extraordinarily wise and important comment, but because uh, it says something about our understanding of Smith, uh, and it also says something about our understanding of human uh, interaction. Uh, and uh, let me just be clear about what I think that says about Smith. So first of all, uh, Adam Smith, I do not think is properly thought of, and I make an argument in my book that he's not properly thought of as a, uh, as a general equilibrium or indeed a neoclassical uh, uh, economist. Um, uh, uh, and this, in a way, hints at his a deeper understanding of uh, exchange and of markets. I mean, he thinks of, uh, he doesn't think of individuals as being a fixed or isolated vehicles for preferences. He thinks of them as uh, what you might say, shape-shifting, flexible, dynamic, social. Uh, and he takes their preferences as um, constantly changing, ordered and reordered by human exchange and by the disposition to truck uh, and barter and not uh, fixed uh, or, or rigid. And of course, he thinks of competition not as a process of uh, uh, ending in static uh, equilibrium, but as a continuous activity of jockeying um, for uh, advantage. I think that's a more accurate picture. And the reason I mention this, we think it's so important, is because I think he bizarrely, or surprising, perhaps counterintuitively, points us uh, in the direction that um, we, we need to go. And that is a recognition that human exchange presupposes uh, imagination, uh, moral norms, trust, uh, interaction, and indeed uncertainty. And because it presupposes those things, it's A, an intellectual mistake to think of Smith as somehow hermetically sealing his uh, political economy and the wealth of nations from his moral theory and the theory of moral sentiments, which is all about how moral norms come to be formed through social interaction. Uh, but he's also pointing us not just to the deeper integrity of his own theory, but to the way in which we should take our own thinking uh, in the 21st century. And, uh, and he's also pointing to the fact that these things that we might think of in a financial model as being the results of uh, exchanges of a kind to be found on a trading floor are themselves embedded in uh, moral imagination, uh, trust, uh, and human interaction. I think that is the core idea tying together. And as soon as you leave out the social, the psychological uh, elements from this, the ethical elements from this, the normative elements from this characterization of exchange, you are um, missing something very deep about what exchange really is, uh, as well as misunderstanding Smith's own view. Um, if I now just uh, 
uh, tell you where I think this is heading. I, I, I mean, we have seen, and, and Andy and others have discussed, it's a well-known phenomenon, a move towards uh, biological, uh, epidemiological models uh, in policymaking. And very interesting uh, that is too. I think that nudges us towards what you might call a more messy, a more evolutionary, uh, a more iterated, uh, um, as well as a more agent-based uh, approach. Uh, uh, I think it nudges us towards a slightly different conception of what economic principles are. If we give up the idea that economics um, uh, has aspirations to be a hard science, uh, and we accept the facts of dynamic interaction, then it pushes us away from a kind of formalistic concern with the truth that actually isn't truth to tell even available in that sense really in science, given its provisional and conditional nature. It also pushes us uh, towards a more, what I would call a more artisanal understanding of principles. We start to think more about, le less about what is true in some academic sense, and more about what really works. And actually, bizarrely, as any physicist will tell you, that's often what happens in physics, because what happens in physics is the math is often developed quite separately. It sits in little bottles in the apothecary shop, and then a good physicist will come along and goes, you know what, we could really do with a bit of this, you know, um, uh, in the 19th century, we could really do with some of this, some um, these strange geometries, uh, if we want to describe the physics of curved space, and uh, uh, the like in the 20th and 21st century, it pushes us towards if I was going to adapt to some scholastic language, uh, what you might call an economica utens rather than an, um, an economica docens of a kind to be found in the university faculty. So the question then is, how um, can we run alongside, how can we supplement, how can we resolve the potential contradictions between what you might call a post-war Asian formalism with uh, what I'm going to call a, a Smithian interactionism? And what would that lead to? And I think it would, it would lead us towards uh, a, a conception of uh, economic policymaking as uh, rough, uh, dynamic responses using repeated simulations that test both assumptions and outcomes. They don't start from axioms which are unquestioned, they're more like a, uh, a natural deduction system in logic where you're constantly thinking about the status of your premises and potentially adding premises at the same time. And so I think that is a more interesting way for us to think about the methodology uh, of what you are doing. And I think it has this very interesting further consequence that it doesn't just um, nudge us towards perhaps a different view of what you might call macro macro. It also nudges us towards a view of what you might call micro macro. That is to say, the way in which these kinds of ideas play out within specific uh, communities. Um, and of course, they might be cities. And I don't need to tell you that that's an agenda which has enormous relevance and interest as we seek to recover from COVID and set a new uh, economic uh, chart uh, ahead. So with that in mind, uh, let me thank you very much indeed uh, and um, move on to any questions uh, you might have. Thank you very much indeed, Jesse, for that, um, or should I say Dr. Norman, for that <laughs> uh, wonderful tour de force. Um, uh, I have a number of questions um, that I would like to begin with. Um, one thing I would like to start with is um, the role, with your background of, of Adam Smith and thinking about morality and markets, the role of technology and how that could lead us to be more, perhaps more distant, um, you know, uh, the way that we form opinions now can be very quick. It can get all sorts of, um, well, fake news is one thing, which is obviously very important these days, but also the way that we interact. I mean, at the moment we're being forced and thank goodness we've got Zoom that still allow us to interact in this, these very difficult times, but our greater reliance when we get back to, you know, uh, the other side of this, our greater reliance on technology, to what extent is that making some of these connections, some of these circles of sympathy, as Smith called them, more difficult and perhaps could start undermining our ability to create markets and to think about our brethren rather than making it easier. Is that something that concerns you in this in this notion of resilience? I think it's an extraordinarily interesting question. Let's just pick up on that, uh, if I may. So one of the things that's fascinating about, uh, if I'm just going to make the scholarly point for a second about, um, because I think it has relevance, about the theory of moral sentiments is the embedded theory of norm formation that 
Smith has in it. So Smith essentially invites us to consider how we uh, think of our own behavior as viewed by someone else and how we would view their behavior um, uh, and the iterations of that. And that, I don't know if anyone in, on the line is familiar with some of the work that David Lewis and others have done on the nature of convention, but that is, you know, Lewis uh, in a way, a couple of hundred years avant la lettre. And the reason it's so interesting to me is because <clears throat> when you combine that with um, Smith's conception of man's uh, slavish desire to admire the rich and the powerful, you then get this extremely interesting account, not just of how norms may be formed for good or real inside a society, but how micro norms um, emerge uh, through things like virtue signaling and the kind of crowding and ganging behavior that we've seen uh, in social media. And of course that is uh, absolutely fascinating and it's a constant preoccupation of government. I mean, part of the problem from government is that in a famously bad news um, has uh, uh, you know put its clothes on and nip around the block before you good news has pulled its uh, boots on and um, that is true and uh, since in, in these uh, lily padding intellectual days of Wikipedia people tend to move very quickly from one idea to another and since uh, uh, the investment in a belief is a significant investment that no one wishes to revise that they can possibly avoid it, since changing your mind is a cognitively expensive act. Um, everyone is constantly looking for things that reinforce the beliefs they already have. And uh, that, that itself, I think, raises huge challenges for economics, uh, understanding the embedded forms of people's behavior uh, and what would change them. But it also makes a huge difference to how we should think about the wider context of political economy in which these policies have to find uh, for not merely be formulated but also be accepted. Mm. Um, and, and a follow-up question that uh, um, I want to ask is about the notion of morality and markets which you raised, um, which of course is fascinating because in many ways in modern economics since Lionel Robbins defined it as uh, an allocation of scarce resource amongst fixed ends, i.e. our preferences. We've sort of delegated morality to the market prices that, you know, if, if you know, say nurses who do, you know, something we both agree is extremely valuable work, if that's the market price, although that is a state price, it's probably not a good example, but, you know, other clearly worthy jobs, um, if the demand supply is such that the price is low, um, does that take us away from our how we view others in society morally because we start putting a price on everything um so extremely rich people you know the great jeff bezos you know approaching a trillion dollar wealth and so on that we start losing our morality the more that we uh ascribe market prices as being the moral judges the single moral judges of outcomes rather than having some notion of contribution being the more important aspect. Is this something that sort of concerns you as we move towards technology, but more and more market-based only economies? I'm thinking here about the Green Book, um, you know, ways we can influence human behavior indirectly to get people to think, uh, find other ways of valuing uh, inputs and outputs other than just cost-benefit analysis. Um, uh, uh, Angus, the trouble is your question is you raise about 50 things at once and so it's yeah. extraordinarily <laughs> um, hard to <clears throat> respond to all of them. Just pick out a couple of themes from what you've yeah. just very pregnantly said. So of course one of the fascinating things is the way in which um, the economics profession's view of its own um, agenda and its own discipline has changed and so you've got Lana Robbins's uh, uh, definition but of course you know there are some uh, maximally inclusive views that would regard economics as the study of incentives as such and um they're not even necessarily economic incentives i mean that's a remarkable a remarkably ambitious claim i think the way i would think of it is um that uh, I, of course i come to this in a way that i hope consistently reflects my view that um no man or no woman is an island in the way that i've described and that uh, human beings um, have meaning within context, within social context, in some way, you know, absurdly, roughly analogous to words and sentences. And the reason I say that uh, uh, is because I, I come from a, uh, and the cards on the table, a kind of Burkean view of the world in which what really matters to human flourishing and human freedom is uh, society. And society may have bad bits, they're the bits you want to improve because uh, it's a reactionary position to accept what you're given and not seek to change any of it. 
Um, but this rather Burkean view is that you should uh, understand society as a uh, something you've been given, seek to preserve it and pass it on. And it affords you um, the basis of human freedoms and a life well lived. Now, if that's true, then, it, you know, somehow it, it couldn't be more counterpointed or opposed to this very, um, I'm pleased to say, increasingly questioned and very suspect idea of, of um, meritocratic hubris, because what it basically says is, be you never so high, um, the law and your fellow human being is at least above you or on a level with you, and you almost certainly owe what you've achieved to luck, and you'd better shut up and have a degree of humility about this. And it contrasts with a kind of liberal individualism, which basically says, you know, uh, 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 um, that uh, human beings um, deserve what they get, and therefore, <clears throat> if you are at the bottom of the tree, bad luck. Uh, it's probably what you deserve and and simultaneously since it tends to be the elite saying these things they do very well and um uh, i'll make my way to my country club thank you very much so i it pushes you towards a view of a policy making which would encourage mixing <clears throat> one of these i like buses um is because you mix with people on a bus um and you can see where you're going uh, i mean and i think there are, that's that is a metaphor for a wider view of society um the other thing it does is and I think here we can use a bit of rules to help us. I've just written a big piece on rules for uh, prospect. Um, but imagine, you know, we were actually looking at our society from outside and thinking, well, what are the rules if we didn't know where we were? We couldn't appeal to our own meritocratic sense of uh, self um, uh, worth. Uh, and, you know, we had to, we might have to allow for the possibility that we were going to be um, in those uh, caring sectors of society whose value has been so perfectly shown by COVID on whom we so rely and yet whom the price system um, so ill rewards. Uh, and we might have a very different view. And what is fascinating is that even in Rawls's position, you may recall <clears throat> one of his principles is the difference principle. And the difference principle broadly says that um, policy should be guided in a way that maximizes the well-being of the least well off. Now, you might take that that's actually compatible with quite a lot of inequality in principle. And you might ask yourself the question, well, is that really a position we would want to take, given what we now know about status, hierarchy, um, the moral effects of distributional outcomes, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's an astonishingly rich and important future agenda. Fantastic. And, uh, and a sort of slight follow on question from that. Eric Beinhocker has um, uh, raised this issue of solidarity um, and uh, perhaps social capital. And as it's asked, uh, should policymakers view social solidarity, in quotes, as an economic policy objective? Well, uh, I, very I think, controversial. I, very I think they regard it as a policy objective. I'm not sure they regard it as an economic policy objective, in part because I don't think the economics profession has kind of given them a theory that might use that. Mm. Um, but I don't, th I don't think there's any doubt that um, politicians are acutely aware of um, the, the forces that keep people together. They're not always very good at using them, and they often put themselves uh, for uh, positions of short-term advantage in contexts which actually end up increasing division rather than uh, reducing it. And sometimes they do that for very good policy reasons. Uh, uh, but I think it is true that, that um, people are increasingly, in politics and in policy, aware of the, the benefits of solidarity. Let me give you a little example mm -hmm. of that, mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, I think that, uh, I, I don't uh, uh, think that, uh, I don't think we particularly want to draw a, a, a huge comparison, but I, I think if we, um, I think we as a country, and uh, I think economists as a profession, policymakers, understand the importance of work, understand the importance of employment now in a way that perhaps they didn't understand it 20 um, or 30 years ago. And I think that is a very, very profound shift. And in part, that's because of the status and dignity of work. And in part, it's because of our awareness of the fabric of companies as institutions, as employers. And in part, I think it's an awareness of the regional effects if you may get uh, localized uh, unemployment or underemployment. And certainly, if I think about the COVID policy responses we've put forward from HMRC and the Treasury, we've absolutely been trying to think about what is the fairest way 
uh, of protecting the most vulnerable people and businesses in our society. And I think that sense of solidarity has been rather an important factor. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and another question has come uh, about um, the economics of climate change and biodiversity um, and the, it's lost, uh, the extent to which macroeconomics should really be um, uh, taking that as very much part of its agenda in looking at how we can actually think about the environment as you know uh, very much the, the sort of ultimate context of everything we do from an economic point of view um how can it help us getting this over exploitation uh uh rather than this sort of very much market-based view at the moment is there a way that macroeconomics should really start to incorporate this as part of its uh, overarching agenda it's such a good question and i i wish i had uh, had time to talk about the green environmental aspects of uh, the kinds of thinking that I was outlining in my very small number of slides. I wanted to keep it 15 minutes. I'm delighted we can pick it up in yeah. conversation. Yes, I mean, it comes out of my view, uh, in a way it's a natural corollary of my view about past generations and the um, enormous benefits that we have received from the society we have in inherited and the moral obligation to improve that and pass it on. It falls out of that view that we need to have similar regard for future generations. Um, we must be um, aware of the obligations that were incurred by our predecessors and seek to uh, discharge them and to meet concerns that um, arise out of that. And that means understanding the legacies and continuities of some quite nasty things in our own history, potentially. But it also means looking forward to what the future uh, may bring. And, and I think, I mean, I'm, this is not an area in which I'm very expert, but I suspect that you will, that, that we find in macro that it is highly focused on a certain kind of green agenda that has to do with, um, you know, the economics of particular uh, kinds of project at the micro level or the economics of carbon at the macro uh, and how to uh, achieve certain policy goals. That what I don't think we're really doing is quite thinking in as rich and integrated a way as I would like about, um, for example, biodiversity, um, species loss, uh, extinction, those wider sets of issues which have an enormous impact on our well-being and of course on our future health since they probably nurture microbes that may be helpful to us uh, uh, in future uh, and I think that's an extraordinarily interesting agenda and since it's an agenda that bears on hu all human activity I, I think it's likely to bear on uh, the activity of political economy in its, sen in, its in that wider sense as well. Wonderful. Um, we've had a couple of other questions. One is about the link between micro and macro policy. And I want to draw this out in something which you've touched on a number of times this morning, which is regions and regional policy, uh, which of course in some ways sits between the two a little bit. Um, and there's been some, you know, terrific models that are nearly 50 years old now, I guess. Thomas, I'm thinking Thomas Schelling's uh, segre segregation um, uh, models where well, in you know, micromotors and macro behavior, it's a phenomenal yeah, piece. I love incredibly that. clever. Uh, and you the the discipline's got beyond that, <laughs> yeah. And yet, you know, here we are with clearly parts of the United Kingdom making great progress and other parts, frankly, struggling relatively. Um, and the extent to which you think that we're making progress or the economists are coming out with the right sort of ways of exploring regional policy. Do you think there's more needs to be done or I think, think it's we're a, getting it's, there? It's so interesting. I, I would, um, I actually feel more optimistic about this than uh, one might uh, think given kind of wider concerns. I, I think uh, two things. One is that uh, there's quite a lot of government policy that's actually been rather effective in this area, a thing called Transforming Cities Fund, where we've put quite a lot of money into intra-city transport and other schemes, cycling and walking and the like in cities. I think that will be shown to have been a very wise public investment over the longer term. Uh, and I think it, it, it goes well because it, it, it fits well with the metro mayoralty as a, as a, as a, as a, a mechanism for governing locally. Um, I think there is a problem associated with that, which is, and we're seeing it actually playing out uh, at the moment, which is the Metro mayors 
um, tend to say thank you very much indeed bank what it is and then try to come back for more. There's no budget constraint. So we need to find some way of liberating more local energy by imposing a slightly harder budget constraint than perhaps uh, uh, government has. Uh, but I also think, and this is perhaps even Pollyanna-ish, but I actually think there's a bit of a recipe for effective uh, development. Uh, and let me just very quickly sketch out what it is. And of course, there are people on the call who will know a thousand times more about this than I do. And I'm, uh, I'm hoping very much I'll have time to be able to uh, uh, listen to what Paul Collier says later. And uh, um, there are several other people um, amongst your incredible smorgasbord of delight that um, uh, uh, will be speaking to this and that do play to the two sides of the agenda, what you might call them, the, the, the micro macro and the, or the macro micro and the macro macro. Uh, I think the, um, but the recipe goes like this. And you see it in this thing that the government's launched called the Stronger Towns Fund, which I think is quite interesting. Relatively small amounts of money, 25 million pounds. But in order to get that, it forces local uh, uh, areas, cities, small towns, uh, towns and small cities, to come up with a plan to set up a separate board, which formulates the plan, to do an enormous amount of consultation, to, to step away from petty local rivalries to the extent they can and party politics and then to present this plan to government in a way with some expert input and advice on on regeneration which can be evaluated and what i like about that is that it broadly speaking follows the heseltinian principles of urban redevelopment of a kind you saw in liverpool or in um uh in in canary wharf and that is although of course those are two radically different situations um uh, and that is that once you've got everyone behind a plan and everyone is signed up and there's no scope for lying and cheating and defecting within the given area and it sets a wider agenda then of course you've built something that goes well beyond the relatively small amount of activation energy triggering money you've given it and, and i think that could be very very interesting and of course it forces every uh, area to ask itself well what is distinctive what do we really care what is our terroir what is the what is the um the element in our history and our past and our distinctive genius that might give us a claim for the future not just to public money but to private money and since there is a private component these things have to be privately led i, I think that's a potentially really interesting recipe and i think it provides lots of fascinating potential experimentation prospects for your agenda as you seek to go into the next stage and so you know one thing i, I must uh, you know just listening to you ask uh, on the back of that something which um i was quite keen on pushing around this Scottish referendum way back in 2014 now, gosh, it seems quite a long time ago, um, which is why don't we allow sub-central levels of government in this country to own to raise their own bond finance? Now, I'm well aware of the potential moral hazard issues, but, it, you know, that's in a first best world. We're a long way from a first best world. This is called reality. And we're the only advanced economy that does, doesn't have sub-central finance, that everything's raised by the central government. Um, apart from small amounts. Now, tricky bit, you know, not having that, you resort to sort of pocket money finance and pocket money devolution where you allocate a certain amount of money. You don't really have responsibility for finding out how things worked or how things didn't work. And I remember raising this to Andrew Tyree and he just sort of rolled his eyes in the Treasury Select Committee saying, no government will ever allow this in the UK. You know, times change. And I wonder whether that could be part of, uh, you know, a bigger discussion of a future way to really get at reinvigorating parts of the UK regions. Uh, well, uh, you tempt me into um, <laughs> a very deep bog indeed there, uh, Angus, and, and I'm afraid I'm not going to uh, put a foot on it. But what I will say is that uh, the, the, the lack of uh, the presence of moral hazard and the lack of a proper budget constraints are a serious problem for that agenda. And the reason why other countries or other areas may be able to do it is because they uh, uh, have solved or adequately addressed um, some of those issues. And of course, because they probably have more local revenue raising and more local discretion over local revenue raising than we do. And um, that raises much wider questions of the, the nature of the British polity and whether centralization in government is a cause or an effect of uh, that conception of a British polity that we've built over several hundred years. And, and of course, in many ways, it'll, it'll be both. So uh, I, I'm not going to get too far involved in that. I will just point out one little thing, which is we have a local government, I think called the Public Words Loan Board, um, yeah. which I'm afraid 
uh, feels to many local government uh, officials like free money. That's not a good thing either. A hundred percent. We completely agree on that. Um, I've had a question in from Richard Bronk, uh, who uh, um, has written many great pieces on radical uncertainty and imagination. And uh, he says, given the endemic radical uncertainty, would he, you, also like to talk about the role of imagination in helping us use a variety of economic models to diagnose emerging patterns, to make sense of uncertain future, and where the future is not a statistical shadow of the past? Gosh. Um, I mean, it, it, Richard has thought more deeply about these issues of uh, imagination in economics than I, I will ever be able to do. So uh, it's, it's a question which he will know a dozen answers better than, than me. But I would say that, uh, uh, yes, I, I do think that uh, uh, the, the moral imagination that enshrouds exchange is, I think, slightly different from the imagination that uh, we will need in thinking about uh, unbidden possibilities. And often what we need is a kind of discipline. This is why, um, it, it's horrible to say it, but this is why some of those grids and checkboxes are remarkably helpful because they force the mind out of its normal guide rails and to think about possibilities that may not have been contemplated. And, and many of those will be irrelevant. Many of them will be simulations we want to throw away. Um, but some of them will play directly to uh, concerns and issues that we have. And I think there's a huge agenda in that area. And uh, I would be very excited about it. The, the 18th century, there's a nice description distinction that they have in, in the 18th century between the imagination and the fancy. I, I want to be sure that we're not using our fancy and that what we come up with is not fanciful. I, I'd like us to be imaginative in that disciplined sense. Fantastic. Um, we have time for one more question. And I would like to take you back somewhat if I may to the days when you became Dr Norman and the subject of your PhD thesis which I think <laughs> was around geometry if I'm not mistaking, mistaken and um, the reason why I find this so interesting is you talked about words and how words in your presentation are not unique to us but when we use them we create a different imagination with the listener and words of course we can either put them together to create one sense, which is like an in IKEA instruction manual, which is kind of just a set of instructions, or we can put them in a different ordering and they create a feeling through poetry. This just words, it's just letters being reorganized again and again, but they have totally different effects on us. And in some ways that's the property of macro it's putting things in a different order, getting a totally different aggregate outcome, even though they're the same ingredients, just letters being reorganized. And I wondered, going back to your, your, your dissertation, your thesis on geometry, whether this is really outside of anything Euclidean, whether this is just a whole different scientific paradigm, or did your thinking actually have scope for these sort of ideas? Were there inklings then already of this greater world out there? Uh, uh, I mean, where to begin on that question, Angus? You've committed the egregious faux pas. Uh, <laughs> you invited me to talk about uh, uh, the philosophy of mathematics in a public context, which I never do. Um, <laughs> nothing, nothing could be further removed from the world of politics. Uh, uh, yeah, no, so, so uh, you've been rather elusive. So let me just say very quickly, my thesis, uh, my PhD was on um, uh, reasoning, visual reasoning in geometry, in particular um, Euclidean geometry. And uh, one of the arguments I was making was that there's a way of thinking about reasoning with diagrams, which uh, can give it some of enough of the formal properties of a system for it to confer justification and ultimately play a role in proof, while giving us an account of human reasoning that does not rely on sentences in a logical language, because there's a kind of logicist reduction, which says, whenever you do some thinking, whatever you think you're thinking, what's really happening is a computer is just spooling through sentences in a logical language in the background. And uh, that's um, a, a view that I think is um, hopelessly wrong. Uh, but you can, although you can, you know, there's no limits to what you can in principle represent if you're sufficiently ingenious in a logical language. Actually, there are limits in principle, but we won't go into those. Um, so, so the point on but the point, just to get back to the point you're making, mm -hmm. one of the things that that does point you towards is the question of whether you can combine formal properties for purposes of 
uh, logically conclusive proof with um, the heuristic properties and the shadows that go with a visual representation. It might be a, a, a diagram, it might be a word. Uh, now, of course, a, a word carries with it an indefinite array of linguistic potential meanings. And, and the best person for thinking about this in history, in my experience, is the American philosopher Peirce, the great mm -hmm. semiotician, who writes about the interpretants. So sentences, these, these, these signifiers have interpretants that await a future um, reflective, uh, as it were, engagement um, to determine or to have their meaning, some future mind um, will find their meaning. Now, that I think is a much more interesting, philosophically interesting place for an ever expanding uh, intellectual agenda in um, um, political economy, in uh, rethinking macro, in tying together these subjects, because it suggests that whatever point of arrest you have received in your current thinking or achieved in your current thinking is itself merely an arrest which imposes some logical weaknesses, but lays the lays the way. In fact, is a, is a, almost certainly a a, um, a a a point that you will be casting away to rise above in in achieving a higher level of of understanding. And that suggests that that amazing achievement of Valray and achieving a a, a, con a conception we think of as a modern conception of equilibrium might itself be something that, in due course, we see as a special important part of our history, but not uh, by any means the final, let alone the pre-final or even the pre-pre-final answer to these dynamic issues of interaction, which have an ever unfolding and ever um, open future. Jesse, there's a lot of congruence there with what we're trying to achieve with social macroeconomics. Um, that was a superb introduction to the conference. Thank you very much indeed for your generous time. Uh, it's very much appreciated. And uh, we will stay in touch with you, of course. Um, but on behalf of um, Rebuilding Macroeconomics, thank you very much indeed. And we will be, unless you would like to make a final. No, it's been a huge pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank Happy you with your efforts. Have a marvellous conference. And uh, I can't wait to tune into more of it. Fantastic. And uh, our next session is actually at 10.30. So we have a 15-minute refreshment break uh, where Ekaterina Svetlova, who is one of our um, uh, hub leaders uh, of the Finance Hub, will be chairing that session. So that'll be in 15 minutes and it's going to be on levels of analysis and social, inter social interactions in a socially structured and organized society. So please join us in 15 minutes at 10.30 and we'll start again uh, with our first panel.